presentation. So we'll go ahead and get started so we can be respectful of your guys' time. Welcome to the Universal Design for Learning ECHO series. This is session three of our seven part series. So the purpose of this project is to support post-secondary faculty in learning about the principles of UDL and provide some resources and strategies to meet the diverse needs of your students. We are using the Project ECHO framework for this series. So followed by, once we have our little didactic portion of the series, we will follow it up with a case presentation. And just wanted to give you guys a heads up that this ECHO is brought to you by the North Dakota Inclusive Model Pathways for College and Career Training uh, Consortium, uh, also known as IMPACT. IMPACT college programs offer access for students with intellectual disabilities to co attend college with their peers. And their mission is vital as it empowers individuals with intellectual disabilities to access higher education, resulting in improved job prospects, higher wages, and overall greater independence. So thank you for supporting their mission by being here today. Your participation is key to the success of our series. We aim to create an interactive community where our presenters, stakeholders, and community members are there to communicate and support each other during sessions. We encourage you to keep your camera on if you're willing and able and also comfortable doing so. And we appreciate when you are engaged in asking questions after the didactic and provide feedback for the case, uh, the case narrative. These cases are the best way to solidify skills that are learned in the didactics and receive direct advice if you would like to present a case yourself. Um, if you have a student that's maybe struggling and you would like some additional uh, strategies and resources, please let us know and we can incorporate that into future sessions. Please note that if we are presenting a real case from someone in the audience to um, respect their confidentiality, avoid using their first names or any identifying information that may identify that student. And we'll go ahead and get started with some introductions. Uh, we'll start with our ECHO Hub team. I'm Krista Opstadal and I am a, the project director or project ECHO director here at the North Dakota Center for Persons with Disabilities at Minot State. Kyle, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Absolutely. I am Kyle Erickson and I handle a lot of the evaluation piece plus whatever Krista wants me to do on the side here at Minot State. Thanks, Kyle. I'm Jessica Reiswig. I work for the ASTEP project at Minot State University. I also work for the IMPACT Consortium and also help facilitate ECHOs. And also on our team, we have Jody Patchen. She's um, one of the assistants on Project ECHO. And we want to give a shout out to our hub team that also consists of uh, Dr. Molly McKinnon, Mark Coppin, Maggie Bentz, and Jordan, or I'm sorry, Jordan Bentz. Uh, Maggie Beckin, and am I missing anybody? Sorry, I don't have my list in front of me. So thank you guys all for helping us come up with this series. And we'll go ahead and turn it over to Sarah. So thank you so much for being here today. Oh, I, I appreciate uh, being asked to be here. I will go ahead and plop in here a couple times, um, well, or throughout it, just a short bitly to the presentation if you want to be able to copy it and see it, because I know Taking on resources are one thing, we need them later to share, to refer back to, to have. Um, so I'll try to post that again later on with it. Um, I will go ahead and get my screen sharing on. Please note, I do not mind at all being interrupted during, while I'm talking, I don't find it to be interrupting. I would prefer, if you guys have questions, pop them in, interject comment um I, I i know whenever we meet online like this it's always hard to uh ask a question to come off our mic we always feel like we're interrupting it will never bother me um so i'm i'm sarah curry i'll give you a short who i am because i think it really frames how i approach universal design for learning how i approach just the classroom education all of these these pieces um I come from the high school setting for about 20 years, working 
I am social studies educator by trade. I was also a high school principal. Um, and one of the first, probably about my second year of teaching, I had a class that any student on the individual education plan <laughs> was put into that class. And so I had a large number of, of students in there with, in, with, with education plans. And it was so eye-opening to me as this young 22 year old going to take on the world, change everything educator. I, you know, and they always tell you, you know, be strict, all these different, different things. And it was just eye-opening for me because it made me acutely aware of slight tweaks in my class and changing of what turned out to be stupid rules on my part helped me to um, see what students would learn, what they were able to do. Um, and it was just, it was just incredible. So th this is kind of where I come from. And then in the administrative role, I spent a lot of years getting to know students and hearing just their needs in a, in a whole different, different way. And so it questioned why I have a due date for something as to when it is, as opposed to what is really my goal. My goal is really to get students to learn. And so this is really where I, where I come from on it, um, how I can get students, any learners to have the I can attitude. And so um, after I left the K-12 world, I then went into teaching at the higher level at NDSU. I was in our school of education in there for a while. Um, I taught teachers that wanted to be principals. And then now I work in our office of teaching and learning with our online program, which is just an assortment of things. And all this to say, I have an incredibly eclectic, I think, background. Um, so off we go. Like I said, please feel free to interrupt, ask questions, share, um, join in any way. I do have the chat up, so I'll try to also keep an eye if anything is there, is if you have any questions. So what is this um, universal design for learning? And it really is just based on multiple, multiple, multiple. How many ways can I share out information to students? How many ways can I get them um, to express, to partake in it? How many ways can I get them to share their, their, their answers back? How well, might I just have those different ways, different options for them? And, and it, it's funny, as I was going through this presentation, I had a, I have a nine-year-old and she was trying to figure out why the days are so short now. And I'm trying to explain to her in the car why the days are so short right now. And she's just like, mom, I have no idea what you're saying. I don't understand any of it. So I'm trying to do like the whole hand motion. It's like, this is our students. They need information in different ways. Words doesn't always work. Sometimes they need that visual and that really becomes that universal design for learning. How can I get, how can I share information out and receive information out in a multitude of ways? Um, one thing we have to be very clear about what it is not, it is absolutely not a lowering of expectation. Universal design for learning is not a changing of expectations. It is simply a sharing, opening my class up, opening the learning up, to people to engage in it in different ways, using their different senses possibly, but it has nothing to do with the rigor of my class. I can have universal design for learning and have amazing rigor and have amazing expectations for class. And I know I've encountered some faculty who are like, but no, it is not. Why is, why is it needed? I mean, this before we even get to the different, what it looks like in, in the higher ed classroom, why is it needed? We have to meet students where they are at. We absolutely have to look at our students and where, what are their needs? Um, we have to allow students multiple ways to learn and, and overcoming these barriers. And it's an awareness for faculty and for staff. Not all barriers for, that we're trying to overcome here are visible barriers. Um, why do we need UDL? Because these students are going to leave us if we don't offer it for them. We need to provide it. We, we need to quit having these students always have to ask all the time for everything. They get, I mean, it's tiring, right? To ask the same thing over and over again. They get frustrated, rightfully so. We just need to approach our class design in a way that thinks about who our students are. We also happen to live in an area, a state, 
where our students are often shy. Um, faculty, staff can be intimidating. Um, and, and not because any of us mean to, but we can simply be intimidating. So we need to look at how we can just embed the universal design within our course to help everybody. Um, I mentioned I come from the high school setting. I have encountered some individuals who work with our students and are incredible educators at teaching our young students to advocate for themselves. And I've run into others who, I mean, run into other school systems. There's no advocating. They don't teach the students how to advocate for themselves. So we at higher ed have students coming to us who have to learn how to navigate higher ed and navigate it through their accessibility issues. We've got to remove these these barriers. These barriers just aren't aren't fair. They aren't equitable. They aren't they really they aren't right to have. And so we need to provide the, these opportunities. Yeah. And at the end of the day, UDL benefits all learners. It benefits everybody. So it's not um, I Sometimes faculty, I, I know, will feel we, we're tired, especially right now, right? We are all tired. It is getting to be the end of the semester. It is dark outside. We are <laughs> we are all grouchy. We're all realizing we only have about a month to get shopping done for people. Like we're all getting grouchy and stressed out. Um, but doing these things helps all of our students out. I, I, I'll continue to use myself as an example. I have a three and a nine-year-old. I was doing some assignment one night and I was so mad that the video didn't have a transcript. Not because I needed to access it, but I had a sick kid. And if I had a transcript, I could sit there and read it while they were laying next to me sleeping as opposed to the video and the bright screen, waking my really crabby three-year-old up. Um, it benefits all of our students. Um, we have faculty discovering that when they record their lectures, they have students who go for a run while listening to it and engage in the in the content. So um, it's this idea of this really will open the door uh, for everybody. Keep an eye on my time here. Make sure I don't, sometimes I can get off on my soapbox. So um, I, I also truly, again, this is coming from that, that, that student-centered focus. UDL can help our students overcome a, a feeling of imposter syndrome that many of our students face in college. When they come here and they're like, am I smart enough for this? Can I really do this? Am I really able to do this? Yes, because we're giving them multiple ways to, to learn. When we embed this, it helps them out and they can realize I can. And if they can discover an I can in any one class, Oh, the empowerment they get in more classes. So this comes from CAST. CAST is great at, at having a ton of resources on UDL. This guide for using it, this is why I, I shared and, and, and I see uh, we'll also upload a copy of all this information to, to Echo. This is a great checklist for um looking at overall UDL, but the questions to ask, and we're gonna dive into this as we go forward, but this will be the, the graphic to start out with is how might I, how do I look at my class? How do I look at a program, a presentation, any material I'm sharing out with students? It can be um, the, the, e the never ending emails that universities send out to everybody. How do I ensure all of this, that I'm giving multiple ways to engage a student? multiple ways for them to engage the what that they're learning and the how. How do I build on it? How do I internalize it? Okay. I'm gonna dive into this more and then we'll come back to it. So where do we start? This can be very overwhelming to think about accessing a class for everyone, right? Because just in this room, we have a wide variety of our own preferences. Imagine a class, where do we start? Sorry. Um, this is another graphic I think is great from CAST. Um, it, it's theirs. They, they get all credit for it. 
what I'm going to start looking at universal design, I'm going to start making my class accessible to everybody. That's what I have to start with. How will the learners engage with the lesson? What will they do with it? What does it look like from their viewpoint as opposed to my viewpoint? Um, thinking about how the information is presented to them. <laughs> we'll get into this one. Do we like to use a lot of academic jargon in what we're putting out there? And that other people have no idea what it is and thus it becomes very inaccessible. Um, and do we think about how learners are expected to act? What are they supposed to do? Uh -huh. Again, we're going to keep diving into it, but it's kind of nice to have the big picture and then, then zoom in a little bit. Where do we start in making our, our unit, our module, any part of our class accessible? What is it that students need to learn? What is our learning objective? What do we want them to be able to do at the end of that class period? At the end of that um, small unit, at the end of the big unit, at the end of the class, what is it we actually want them to do? When we know that, then we can start taking our small steps to getting there. We can start then doing that backwards design of, if this is my goal, what are the ways students can show me that they've reached this goal? Um, what are the ways I can share with them the material they need to know to reach this goal? But it has to start with that goal in mind. Uh, then we do that back mapping. Then, then we can go backwards. We can start with that tight learning goal. How do I, how do they access the content? Is it in a, a, a talking? Is it in a lecture? Is it through a reading? Do they have a video? Is there an infographic? Do we have the multiple senses? Do we have a couple of these senses being addressed when I'm sharing it? And then again, do they reach that goal? Do we have multiple ways that students can demonstrate their understanding? Do they always have to write a paper? It always have to look like a paper. Can they talk? Can they share with you? Because if they can create a coherent message with a beginning, a middle, and an end that they say to you, they can write a paper. Especially given chat GPT these days, right? Uh, but how can they share with you? Can it be visual? What is it? And again, when you know what your objective is, now I understand the different ways you can show me that you've reached the goal. Because if I'm clear on what my objective is, what students should learn, I can relay that to students. When they come up and say, I would like to do this for my assignment, could I, could my big project for the class be this? Does it meet the objective? Yep. Does it meet the objective? Nope. And, uh, I also highly recommend talking with each other as a where to start always engaging people. These, this is a great starting point. You know, this is not a starting point. This is a great example of how do we get everybody into the same, same room, virtual room, talking about what we all do. I, I will never get up here and pretend I have every, every answer for anything. But in this room, we have a whole ton. We can reach a lot of them. So when we look at the, the pedagogy, a lot of this becomes repetitive, but when I think of multiple ways for students to learn, videos with captions and transcripts, audio, images, readings, do I have to do all of them? Do I do a couple of them? Again, thinking about how they can communicate. Does it always have to be the same thing? I used to work with a teacher. She was hysterical. She had students take different Shakespearean novels they had to read that many of us struggle to read and they got to write it in text language, text lingo. They got to take it and translate and show and do their assignment in text lingo. It was her way of trying to reach different generational learners. She had a lot out of students she wouldn't normally have gotten responses out of. She was able to get some of her disengaged students to be like, well, this, I understand this now. I can do this because they weren't so fearful of, did I put my comma in the right place? <laughs> Oops, cover this one. When we think of people trying to access the class and especially our shy Midwesterners, they sometimes won't ask us questions as to what we mean when we 
throw out acronyms left and right. We have to think about avoiding our academic speak, avoiding our content, our content specific jargon. Have we actually explained it to people? Have we actually told them what this means? Because if I'm trying to access the class and then you also use essentially a different language on me, well, I'm out. I got to decipher and then figure out the content. You have a lot of we're gonna get students like a lot. I this isn't working for me. Um, and again, it helps any and all students. I think back to the first college class I adjuncted for. I had lived in the K twelve world too much, and I was throwing out ad, uh, acronyms to them, and they just all, they all sat and looked at me. And finally, I was like, "You guys don't know what that is." I was like, no. Then I had to explain. But without a few willing to look at me like I was crazy, I wouldn't have realized I had lost the whole class. They didn't. They were still trying to figure out an acronym I had used. Um, and the K-12 world is overly riddled with acronyms. Oh, I love the emojis. Rewriting stories. Oh, I love that. So we, I, thank you, Jessica. That's awesome. See, this is that idea. Like, again, we're not losing the rigor. If the point is to, to narrate, to show, there's a lot of thought process going on here. I think that's hysterical. And you could, you could think of students doing various little TikTok um, videos to turn in. Instead of a reflection, can I do a TikTok? Same thing. But how many students will do a TikTok for you? Snap a picture and narrate it to show. Snap a picture that shows, you know, the application of what we talked about. How many, how many kids would snap you a picture and be like, this is great. And not even, you know, again, is that different ways to engage? get hung up oh yeah exactly on that term mm -hmm. students will be widely distracted by it widely distracted by it and then you're right you're missed that you, you've lost that content so it's trying to it was one of the things i being overly aware for this presentation of accessibility i kept going back to make sure am i spelling things out Did, am i avoiding using shorthand too much or my citations. Syllabus, this is something I, I'm sure all of our campuses require you to post the same comment, the same statement on your syllabus about if you need modifications, if you need accommodations, if I'm sure they all have it. And it's great we have it, it's great it's on the syllabus. However, I'm willing to bet that most faculty have it on there and that is not even a thing they talk about. It's that thing you're supposed to read and it's all put on the students to go and do it. I, I understand the, the rules of higher ed students have to tell us. I understand how the rules work on it. However, if we're wanting all of our students to learn, I mean, that's that universal designing for learning. Then we need to make a moment to talk. We need to stop and put emphasis on this. Create a space for this. Like I talked about, many of our students coming into college weren't taught properly in K-12 how to advocate for themselves. They don't know how to come up and advocate. And to come up and talk to you is scary. And it, again, it doesn't matter. It has not a reflection of your demeanor. You're just scary. <laughs> You're just this new scary world for them. And now they're supposed to come up and talk to you on something that they read, but did they understand the way it was written? Because sometimes academic speak and academic policies are very inaccessible creating the space to tell students, look, if you're struggling, I'm here for you. My goal is for you all to learn. Also, if you need assistance, here's where to go. Thinking of college freshmen and the number of times I have been in my building and I see this poor freshman looking confused and they are in the entirely wrong part of campus for their class. Take a moment. Here's where you go. From this building, here's where the department is. 
on our campus, I see Mark is on here, has been bopping in and out. There's Mark. It's inside the library, but where? That can be intimidating for a student to walk in and go, where do I go? If I'm a faculty and I just share it out and I just tell them, I've made it that much more accessible. They know where to go to find it. Because I know once they get there, those people will be very welcoming and very helpful. I got to get them over there. I got to get them to the door. Okay. Also, how to call, how to, how to email them, just sharing it and making that, that space for them to do it. Um, it's a good thing my poor kid never hears me talk about her. My nine-year-old, if she ever needed to do this, would never be the one to ask, ever. Doesn't matter. She would never come and ask. She would sit through class being confused. But if you just told her where to go, then she would, you, it would open the door for her. All right. Provide clear instructions and expectations. And I know we always, we always do this. We always are sharing like, it's perfectly clear to me. Of course, the expectation makes sense to me. Inviting, inviting student responses. Um, one of the ways I've ended class, weekly classes, um, every class, depending on the, the size and whatnot, is I have a moment for students to write, write to me. What resonated with you from class? What questions do you still have? Um, what are you, what additional information might you need? And it's a chance for them to say, I don't get what we're supposed to do on that assignment. The next class, I don't share any names, but I'm like, all right, a whole bunch of you are confused on that assignment. Let's talk about it. Clearly, I wasn't clear on what I needed, what I was talking about. And as I create this culture of it's okay to tell me you didn't understand, more and more will start to speak up when they realize like, oh, she's just going to help us. She's just going to help us. Um, and so creating that space uh, will help me then also realize how I need to adapt my class. Um, irrelevant, what we, what we cover in class. Scaffolding can be amazing for students. They come into some of our classes. Do they have those bottom steps? Do we have that pathway to them? And I think of our math courses. Math starts here and sometimes their high school is here. <laughs> Uh oh, what do we do? How do we how do we build into them? How do we give them give them outlines? I um I, I think of with this one, my students with high anxiety. I think it is with with any of my students who struggle with anxiety, giving them a ton of low stakes quizzes assessments builds their confidence for that final exam. Um, our accounting folks at the end of the day, if they want to be a CPA, they have to take a highly stressful test. It's just the way that world works. I can get them ready for that if I give them a whole bunch of them along the way. Like, hey guys, here's a quiz. This is going to look a lot like your test. Here's another quiz question. It looks a lot like your test. Here, and giving them a ton of it alleviates a lot of stress. And again, allows students um, just to be more successful. Um, being thoughtful on due times. I should have put due dates. Due date, due times was terrible. Due times and times for projects. Um, this would be again where I would tell students like, hey, I made a mistake. So they would realize I'm human and, and we make mistakes and move on and move forward. Um, be very thoughtful on when things, are, when things are due. Does it need to come in on Monday? Does it need to be there on it? If it does, okay, we we'll share with students. You need this due by Monday because we're going to talk about it in class. But if it doesn't need to be in Monday and you assigned it due Monday and they turned it in Tuesday, is it a big deal? Again, making the class more accessible is sometimes being a little flexible on deadlines, especially for students who simply need more time to process the lesson. Not because they can't understand it, not because they can't do the work. They just need more time to process. Maybe um, there's it, it, just different things that they, sometimes you have to find the different software and the different devices to fully access the class. If they need more time, does it matter that you give them more time? Do you need to penalize them? Or can they simply turn it in late and still achieve, achieve the goals, achieve the objective for it? 
Um, so just that, that, that being thoughtful, is it a rigid deadline? Is it due this day that they can have? What is it? Okay. And having a reason for it. I have smart class sizes in history and art classes offer small point assignments for notes taken during class with summaries at the end. Any type point. And then I even think of like, what qualifies a note? Could they do their notes differently? And especially in an art class. Although I've seen some of my history students coming from history, the way they take their notes sometimes is just, it fascinates me, right? Like, oh, you did it. But it's, yeah, your brain's processing and it gives you a nice check-in, doesn't it? Um, are you getting it? Did you get the point? It's They get a quick point, but you can also see like they got they got what I was talking about or they missed it. I should reteach it. I love it. And that's, yeah. And that's why I love these low stakes quizzes. It's a chance for me to see if I need to reteach this. You all missed it. That's a me fault. <laughs> if you all miss this, that's a me. I need to reteach it. But, or I know this person maybe struggles accessing class and I see they missed it. I might say, Hey, how about you stop it? Let's take a chance to talk about it. Come on in. Let, let's work on this. Um, and it gets to a later point I have about the mastery learning. All right, I got, I, got a, I got a bone to pick with this one. I might get on a soapbox. Provide feedback on project parts and offer corrective opportunities. When we tell students, like I see this one all the time, you missed the point here, you didn't explain it. Well, they sure thought they did. When you tell them they didn't explain it, that sure doesn't help them understand what they didn't get right because they sure thought they did it the first time. Um, be more descriptive on it. What didn't they explain? What were they missing? Because how are they going to fix it for the next one if you don't actually model it and demonstrate it and give them that information? If it's a chance for corrective opportunities, you might say, look, come on in and talk with me. And we're going to redo that assignment because you still need to learn it. The goal is that you learn it. You're going to have that mastery point on it. If it's all up to me to keep things formatted in Word, it's a hot mess. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, this is where my upbringing, I use the outline. But you're right. Some of our students don't, don't know the best way to take notes still coming out of high school. Um, as a former high school teacher, it was something I actually taught to high school students was how to take notes, what they needed to write down. This idea of like what it needs to be and answering those questions. And I think sometimes we still need to do this in college on Here's the information you need to know. And again, that's why these quizzes, these assessments, this formative feedback, formative assessments, really what they are, helps me know, are they getting it? What do they, do they take away what they were supposed to? Are they processing it? Okay. This maybe deviates a little bit from UDL. Um, however, Students would come and tell me all kinds of struggles that they had, needs that they have. I would discover things about them. And I really believe the reason I knew a lot more about my students' lives was because of some of these things. And it helped make me a better teacher because then I knew how to adapt my lessons. I knew how to adjust assignments for different students because I made sure I learned their names. Um, and I learned what name they wanted. Um, again, First year teaching, I had three Michaels in a class. I'm like, all right, we got to figure this out. I'm going to have three Michaels in the class. Why, how are we going to tell the difference between you all? And the one student goes, well, my name's actually an on. Can I call you that instead? <laughs> He's like, yeah. So that was how I got rid of one of the Michaels in class is I had an on and his mother happened to teach next to me. And I didn't have, put this all together, but she came over and she was, you know, he actually thought it was really cool you're calling him by his given name, as opposed to his American name of Michael. It actually really resonated with him. He really appreciated it. And so it's that, what do they actually want? What's their name? Getting to know them and making sure we pronounce it correctly. Um, when I started in college, using our middle names? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure if it was a cultural thing or something, but you would like refer to everybody by their first and middle name. 
I'm not sure if it was a cultural thing, but it was really off-putting because, like, you know, I you know I come from a family of boys, so if I hear my my first and middle name, I think I'm in trouble. Was she southern? No, she was from like oh. Africa. Oh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. But you're, yeah, I, you're right because that yeah, it, that's what I do to my children too. When they're in trouble, they get a full name. Uh, yeah, but it's again, what do they want? Because it makes you feel welcome. And then if I feel a connection to you, if I think you actually care about me beyond grades on a paper, I'm more willing to come in and say, I'm struggling with, I need help with. And this is where I, I strongly encourage when a student misses an assignment, the first communication isn't, here's your zero. The first communication is, hey, I noticed you missed an assignment. Is everything okay? Did you have questions? What's going on? Let's let's form a time to talk. It could be, I, I've been trying, right? But again, maybe that student needed more time. It could be they couldn't figure out the LMS. Maybe your learning management system, the way you have it laid out is awful. You don't know, you know, for that student, they needed help to see how you have it organized. But that first check-in is so meaningful as opposed to here's a zero. Um, Every time recognizing a hard concept, telling them I know it's hard. Um, where's my history teacher? Um, no, I'm going back, can't find it. Oh, Zahara, you, I had my poor students read Federalist 10. Uh, if, you've, if you've read Fe, poor, poor Federalist 10, it is awful. It is god awful to read. It is horrible. And I would let them read it for about five minutes and I and these were high achieving readers and I would see them pretty soon all going I'm like all right so this is difficult like, uh -huh. let's work through it okay what did it, that, that just empathy with them you guys you're right this is hard but we got this let's go through it we got it we can do it um students who benefit most from from UDL often can be the hardest on themselves right they they, they just get that anxiety like it's all me no, no, we got this. We can do it. We can have that growth mindset, this growth, this mastery mindset. I can. I haven't learned it yet, but I can. Okay. Flexible deadlines. Uh, I, I've been flexible on deadlines. Is this is something I don't think reflects skills. You're you're right. One complaint I started receiving is that my students with ADHD feel like this hurts them, but then my other students with other challenges really appreciate it. Has anybody else found a way to navigate this? Yes, ADHD students do tend to need dates, deadlines. You're you're absolutely you're absolutely right. One of the ways I navigate it, and then anybody else, please jump in. I put the deadline in. I, I say it's due. It's due on Tuesday. Good. The assignment's due on Tuesday. Um, and then when the first, you know, if, if I know a student has accommodations, I'll talk with them. Be like, okay. When I say it's Tuesday, you, you have your extra day. No worries. I'm going to say Tuesday. We're good. And I'll have a conversation with somebody who has the, the planned out accommodation. This is where my email back to students when they have a zero is so important. It's like, what's up? What's the deal? You know, like, what's going on? And then I can recognize it, you know, what, what their need is. And so then I have the deadline but I'm not rigid that you're going to get a zero after I follow it up with the conversation to understand what's going on. Um, it's also helped me work through the one student who missed a lot of classes for, for ear infections. I'm like, that's not, I understand they, they stink, but after a couple of days, you can come back. You're, you aren't going to share germs. Um, so that's one of the things I've done. I don't know if that helps you or if others have something to, would, that they like to share. Uh, Leanna, I am that ADHD student that will procrastinate a uh, paper till the day that it's due and then try to pound out eight uh, pages. Kyle and Jessica are like, yeah, Krista, we know we've heard you complain about this many, many times. Uh, gentle reminders. So if the hard due date is like December 10th, 
and you know that it's a longer page and you know we're talking about the papers just gentle reminders hey maybe you should have like a third of it written by this date and like giving them some more broken down smaller deadlines does have you ever tried that and does that work I've I've tried all these things um I have about two to three students every semester who it's just yeah it like never happens and then I've seen it start showing up on evaluations of like I do a mid-semester check-in and I also do like read my evaluations at the end of the year um so it's both this semester and last semester that I've gotten the feedback of just a couple people who are like I have ADHD and the fact that I know that you're never going to punish me like I'm never going to lose out on the points I'll always have an opportunity to turn it in because I know that or as soon as I figured that out I just stopped bothering because I didn't need to worry because I know you'll let me and um I'm just like but I don't feel like I can take away the opportunity for everyone else because it's only two or three students versus the like 20 that I have struggling with depression and family things and all those other things and so I feel like I can't like numbers wise I can't prioritize not to mention that just how to manage it in my brain like I can't like oh these are the students I have to force a deadline on and these are the students I don't or whatever I just haven't been able to find a solution um I mean this semester the thing I'm trying is I have some assignments that do close and I don't reopen them for anybody so those ones, they can't, they get three extra weeks. And after that, that's it. And they've realized that at this point. <laughs> um, but in terms of the bigger papers, like they can't pass the class without them. And so I kind of feel like, you know, they could still get a C without those smaller assignments, but they can't pass the class otherwise. I think you kind of hit on it with not a never ending, not endless time. You get this much so there's still the date the date is still going to come and you can one-on-one -on -one work out with a student who you know is struggling in, in in deeper ways right but it's not unreasonable to say if the unit ends we need to wrap this up and move on so you can do the other things and then you yeah and then you might consider with your larger papers do you have that check-in midway where are you at you need to tell me today maybe it's even a couple of weeks, what have you accomplished today? And it could, this could be their end of the week, simple like checking, completion, right? Where did you get on your paper? And it needs to be more than it was last week. I didn't quantify how much, but maybe a little more would make the crystals of this world. Okay, I got to do a little bit. I have, to, and now, now it's not so much by the time the date deadline is, she only has two more pages to write instead of her eight. But you're right, it, there's, I, I wish we could get it for everybody, right? I wish there was something that always would work for everybody. Anybody who discovers that, I'm in with you because then we've got the million dollar idea that solves learning for everybody. I appreciate you mulling it through though and then having that compassion. Whoops, went too far. This is a document that I know there's a lot on here. Um, and so in the PowerPoint, you can click on this as well as there's an audio mp3 to talk through it but this is some of these concrete things now you know, I, I talked kind of pedagogically about um, behavior about expectations here are some like concrete things we can do to also I increase the, the accessibility but i wanted to point out the other ways in, in which you can download this um, and it is from our office of teaching and learning here but with your documents, being very thoughtful on how you title them for when you upload them to um, your LMS. For all of us in this state, I see we have somebody outside the state, that'd be Blackboard, and how it pulls it down. Um, um, alt text for any of these images, including this. And so again, this way with those who can't read the photo, they're able to see what the photo is of. Um, and that's where we have the audio available. It's not quite the alt text for this, and it should be, but putting that alt text in. Like I said, then those individuals with screen readers, it tells them, here's an image of, and now they can understand what, what's there. Um, these next couple kind of come together here. In, in Word, don't tap. Don't do 80 tabs across. Use the indents. 
use the table for use the headers, use these formatting items. I'm gonna switch screens and I don't wanna be too, oops. The reason for this happens again for, for screen readers, it is incredibly difficult when we have these spaces and tabs in there for the screen readers. So we wanna use these different features for your headings, okay? Using these arrows to move things right and left. Um, having worked with a couple of grad and doc students who have wonderful um, formatting issues, this little annoying icon, I say annoying because it gives you all these little blue things, tells you what hidden grammar, th hidden things you might have in there. This is create havoc. Oh, I see I have a couple I don't want um, for, can create havoc for screen readers. Okay. Um, and again, because I know everybody has different levels of comfortability with, with technology, down here is my accessibility check. This one happens to say I'm good to go. I don't have any problems on this one. I'm, I'm good to go in terms of it being, of this being accessible for some of you might have a screen reader. Um, and I will keep it in a Word document when I would put it up on an LMS because then my hyperlinks stay there, my formatting, it, it stays accessible. If I turn it to a PDF, it becomes harder for individuals to access it. But I wanna also show you this one. Here's a table. Tables are again, something we wanna be thoughtful on how we do them. And you can see I have down here, it says investigate. I actually have an issue with mine. But when I look at what it is, it's the merge cells because merge cells can create havoc again for screen readers and um, tabbing. So uh, I think it'll tell me, it tells me why you should fix it, steps to fix it, it's all in here for you. So I don't even have to Google it. Microsoft just put it all in here. Mine actually isn't that big of a deal because my tab keeps going left to right. It doesn't jump it around and, and it keeps following in a logical way of how a person would read it. So mine's actually not a big deal. For it. While I'm while I'm out here, I'll show you this one too. Again, accessibility says to investigate, and I do have a couple errors on this one. I don't have a title, and it tells me why to fix it, how to fix it. Okay, this one it tells me how to fix it, okay. what I should do for it. This little accessibility again. It's a simple step to go through that allows everybody to navigate this document in the different ways that they need to. Um, but I wanna point out where that is because sometimes the stuff down here, I think blends on us. We don't always, we just don't always pay attention to everything on the screen anymore. We've become a little too used to it, but it'll tell me again, how to fix the things. I'll turn it into text image. So I should have an alt text for my image here. And same here, same thing here. There should be an alt text for it. It's telling me, it's reminding me to have it, to put it down. Uh, I'm gonna go back now. Um, one thing I were talking about beforehand, I, I actually hesitated to pull this. It was a PDF that I pulled off of our website and I hesitated putting it on, but I thought I would include it um, for discussion point. I hate how many words are on this slide. I hate how jam-packed this page is. It is causing, I hate it. I, I can only imagine how other students would feel about this. These ones are nicer in that there's more white space. And even some of these get to be a little too much of words, right? But there's still a lot of white space. I also don't have flowery colors. I don't have a whole bunch of like crazy colors on it because I want it to be easily accessible, easily readable. If I'm projecting this also on a big screen, this contrast is easier for people to see. So this causes me anxiety. Having space, having white space really does help. A, um, you can see the high contrast. These, these pieces are on, on here, but a little bit of the irony or, you know, of this document saying one thing and doing the other. Um, um, you will notice 
I put the title of this document here and hyperlink the title. One thing we often see individuals doing is writing the word link or writing the word article and putting in parentheses. Screen readers, that's incredibly difficult to find that. That's much harder. It, it's, it's confusing. Putting what it is is more descriptive. Um, so there's that little bit there. Trying to make sure I covered the rest of the items that I wanted to cover here. I talked about before, and I saw somebody turned on the, tr the transcript for this, um, which is great because it, it's much easier to have the transcript. It, it's so much easier to, to read through it, to find it for individuals, however they want it. And again, I, I'm, I'm one of those weird people that watches TV even now with trans with the closed caption on. It's just the way I prefer the TV. So there's another one here for PowerPoint. And again, you can take it with you to use it, to look at it when you create it. Um, this is probably one of the, an important thing. I'm noticing a trend back to really busy slides, really busy slide backgrounds. This is kind of becoming a trend again. That can cause distraction issues. It can cause, yeah, it's just, it makes it hard to follow along. Clean and simple animate any videos in there, any pictures, are they meaningful? And then with those pictures should be an alt text. Um, I want to go back and see if I, I do have an alt text on here. Will it show me a click? So this is an image that says start here. That's my alt text for my image. So again, everybody knows what it is. Uh, and I hate doing the scrolling on Zoom, so I'm sorry, because that is super annoying. So I apologize. But again, keeping it simple, because then you can spend more time focusing. Oh, sorry. I'm told I'm taking too long. Um, more information we got here. I got all these resources. I'm actually nicely at the end, so that was a good point. Um, do you want me to talk about, I'm gonna open it up for questions instead of my continuing, unless you want me to point out what I, uh, this part. What would you like me to do, Krista? I talked too much. I'm sorry. No, you're good. That was a fantastic presentation. And I was actually just thinking like, oh, I got so lost in everything you were saying. So that was my fault, actually. <laughs> um, do, do we have any questions? And I know that we actually have a presenter um, in December uh, Luis Perez, who's going to really go in depth on um, making things accessible, just like uh, Sarah had just done. So if you want to learn more about that, we'll have a lot more in depth um, tips and tricks on how to do that in December. I believe it's December 6th, but I, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. Um, and thanks again, uh, Leanna, for posing that question, because that, that's the thing is like these best practices are great, but also, you know, it, it's not a one size fits all. So I appreciate you sharing some real life. Like this is actually what happens when you do that. And we saw that last week too, when Molly was talking about, you know, offering uh, templates, but then some students coming back and saying, wait, do I have to use this? So I, I think it's best to provide all of those options and then just letting people pick and choose um, what they need and what they don't. And yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. And thank you, Sarah, for that amazing presentation. We'll save this case uh, for next week. And um, I hope you guys all have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And Kyle's going to put the, um, oh, wait, I'm sorry. I think he actually logged off. Uh, here is the feedback. He's still there. Oh, he is? He's okay. still there. He's muted, but he's still here. Sorry, Kyle. I thought you had to log off for your appointment. So um, I put the link to the uh, we, we both put the link to the evaluation in the chat. Please take a moment to fill this out. It's really important for our funders so that they uh, can see what was all done here. And we definitely use your comments to improve future sessions. And we did include a couple extra questions on there on what you would like to see in the additional resources that we send out. Um, I, I guess I am curious, have you guys found those additional resources beneficial? If anybody wants to throw that in the chat. We try to include different resources than what was in the presentation 
and um, yeah, we're just curious if those are helpful or if there's anything you would like to see. Oh, that's just fine. And we, so we email them out, but then they're also in iEcho. You can download them from the content section. I can remove the spotlights here. I've taken over Sarah. Alrighty. Well, everybody, thank you guys so much. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. Our next session will be on the 28th and we have uh, Miss Lori Cooney who's going to be presenting. So Lori, we're really excited for your presentation. I know that a handful of people here have worked with you in the past. And so uh, we're very excited for that. And thank you again, Sarah, for presenting. So we take care everyone, safe travels.